What is up, gang? Mr. B here, bringing you another sweet, wicked, awesome math video. This video, I'm going to take you through um, compositional functions and how to find the domain of them. So my students are getting ready to write a test. This is one of the topics that they've learned. And, um, you know, there are a few people having a little bit of trouble trying to get the domain uh, really mastered. And they asked me to do a little review video for them. So I'm sharing it for everyone that uh, might want to see. All right. So if this video helps you in any way, please like, share, subscribe. And anyway, too much talking. Bam. Let's get into the screen. All right. So we've got a couple different functions here. Um, we've got a rational function, one over X. And then we've got a radical function, square root of X plus two. And we're asked to do the composition of functions. So let's have a look at this. Let me get a pen on the go. And uh, examine it. So first of all, what this actually means is f of g of x. So that little symbol there is not a multiplication sign. Usually it's a little bit bigger than that. But what it means is of. So I usually have my students rewrite this to write it like f of g of x. So that's a little more intuitive than, um, you know, f of g of x written like this. So I, most people should kind of have an idea because we're used to dealing with, you know, f of 2. So that really means that x equals 2. We're subbing 2 into f of x. Well, instead of subbing 2 in, we're deciding to sub in something else. And really what can be in here could be anything, right? You could have a kitty cat in here. Let's draw one. Boom, boom, boom. Greatest cat ever. So you could have a kitty cat like that in there. It doesn't matter. All we're doing is we're deciding to make it the functions that we have. And that's what we're subbing in. So usually what I do is in replace of that g of x, I usually take the function that is that particular one. So in our case, it's the square root of x plus 2. Now, if I ask you guys to do f of 2 and you had 1 over x, right? All you would do is sub in 1 over 2. It's no different. So it's just that this is a little bit more complicated. So I'm replacing the x with the square root of x plus 2. So in my f of x, which is 1 over x, that 1 over x is going to become that big thing inside. So 1 over the square root of x plus 2. And that is our overall... Um, composite function. So f of g of x. When I was in school, we always called this unit fog, the fog unit, because it looks like fog when you put it there. So funny story, I'm full of them. All right. So when you go to analyze the domain of a composite function, you can't just look at the final answer. There's things that happen along the way that you really need to consider. So what I get my students to do usually is look at the inner function, so the inside function. And what I mean by the inside function is the one that goes inside the main function, which is f of x. So inside is g of x. So we want to look at g of x, which is the square root of x plus 2. And we also want to look at the final composite function. So the final composite function is um, 1 over the square root of x plus 2. So these will have similar domains because they involve the same root. So we'll be able to use some of the information that we have from this and put it over here, all right? So first of all, what you should know about a radical is that a radicand, so that's a fancy word for saying what is underneath the square root, has to be positive. Obviously, if I put a negative 3 in here, I would have the square root of negative 1, and then um, we can't take the square root of negative 1. It's imaginary. So all we do is we take that x plus 2, and we set it greater than or equal to 0, and then we just solve for x. So we minus 2 from both sides, minus 2 from both sides, and then we get um, x is greater than or equal to negative 2. So that's the domain of my inside function. So now let's look at the composite function. So we still have a square root, but there's something very specific about this square root is that it's in the denominator. So what we know about denominators is that denominators 
cannot equal zero. So I cannot have zero in this um, particular thing. So the value that's going to make this denominator zero is, so if I take x plus two, what's inside the root, and set it equal to zero or cannot equal zero, the value that we end up with is the negative two, right? So my I know that this root cannot equal negative two because if we do, we'll have zero and the square root of zero is of course zero. And when, then we have one over zero, which is gonna be undefined or uh, does not exist. So that's the first thing we wanna note about it. So look at the difference between this one and this one so far. This one includes negative two because we got the equal to part, whereas this one um, excludes negative two. Now we also have the root here on the bottom. So with this little fact, we can say x plus two is greater than zero. So we can exclude the not equal to part because we know that this thing cannot be zero on the bottom and it will not be negative two. So when I go to solve this little inequality, then we end up with x is greater than negative two. All right, so we end up with that overall domain. Generally what I remember for roots, so if a root is in the numerator, so if you have a root in the numerator, then you use a greater than or equal to zero. If it's in the denominator and you have a like a one over root, then you just say greater than zero for the root, all right? So in general, that's what I remember. But this really is the why that we can do that. So we can't have negative two, so we have to exclude it from our interval by leaving off the equal to part. All right, so that's the why behind it. So now once you get those two domains done, you really have to choose the most restrictive. All right, sometimes there might be a combination of both. Sometimes, um, you know, one or the other and sometimes neither. But this one in particular, they're very similar, obviously. So we want to choose the most restrictive one. And what I mean by most restrictive is that if I put any point into my composite function, that it will work. So for example, if I put five into my composite function, I'll be able to work out that number. If I put negative seven in, I'll have a negative underneath the root, I will not be able to work out that number. So then we look at these, which is more restrictive? Well, this piece here has the equal to negative two in it, and we know that x cannot equal two. So this is really the most restrictive domain. X is greater than or equal to negative two. So we can write it out in our you know, proper notation. So I'll use set notation for the first one. So X such that X belongs to, so X such that X such that X is greater than or equal to two, and then X belongs to all real numbers, not equal to, sorry, just greater than. So X is greater than negative two. Sorry, my words are not working right now. Now, Personally, I prefer interval notation for these. So this starts at negative two, and since x is not included, or sorry, negative two is not included, we use a round bracket, and it goes all the way to positive infinity, and infinity always gets a round bracket, just like that. All right, so that's the first one. A little rocky there, but not too bad. Um, the, the important part to keep in mind, guys, is that um, you can never when you're looking at these things, you have to really consider the inside in the, in the inside function and then what you get for your overall answer. And it's a combination of both of those things that contribute to the domain. Sometimes it's one or the other. Sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's uh, one's more restrictive, so you have to use that one. So this is a good example of the more restrictor one. So this example has um, three functions. We got a rational. Uh, radical, and then just a quadratic. And we're going to make a combination f of k of g. So g is the innermost function, right? And then k is the second one. So that's going to be like my middle. So still technically an inside. So these two are really my inside functions. And then this f is going to be the outside function, all right? So we really got to consider what is happening. And the reason I know that is G is the most inside, K is in the middle, 
and then f is on the outside f of g of f of k of g so again we can rewrite this as k of g of x just like that if you prefer so i usually start by just looking at the inside part which is k of g of x so i'll this is my g of x, so remember I'm just going to replace that thing with the x squared, the square root of x squared minus 4. And then this square root is going to go inside that x squared. So where there was an x squared in k, now there's this. It's like this, right? k of question mark equals question mark squared. Doesn't matter what goes there. It could be a kitty cat. It could be anything. <clears throat> So I go ahead and put in my square root of x squared minus 4, and then I square it, and then I'll reduce it down to get x squared minus 4. So the important part to recognize is that, yes, we end up with x squared minus 4, but look what happens. You got rid of a square root. So we still have to consider that inside square root because it's really important. All right. We'd also have to look at this. OK. Um, but that's again, that's just a quadratic. It doesn't really affect anything. So the next part is I'm going to take this function, which is my K of G of X and sub it in to F. And again, it doesn't matter how complicated it looks. All it is is F question mark is going to be one over question mark minus 12. So I'm just going to sub something in to where where x is and i'm just going to use that as the part i sub in so in this case it's f of x squared minus four and then i'll sub in right into that one over x minus 12 except it's x uh, squared minus four minus 12 and when i do that i get one over x squared minus 16. so that's my overall composite function so f of k of g of x and i absolutely despise how that looks uh, over x squared minus 16. so that's the composite function so this has a lot of curious things happening with it so the first thing that we're going to consider is this very most inner function the square root of x squared minus 4. so that's going to give us a lot of uh, limitations because we know that um Square roots cannot have a negative radicand like we talked about in the last part. So when you have square root of x squared minus 4, we know x squared minus 4 must be greater than or equal to 0. So if I go ahead and I want to solve this, I need to find the x-intercepts to really know how this thing is going to work out. So where is the parabola positive is what I'm looking for. So the first thing we need to do is examine the x-intercepts. So we just do difference of squares like that. So basically my x-intercepts are two and negative two, and perhaps you knew that just by looking at it. And then the next step I wanna do is draw a number line. So all I do on my number line is put my x-intercept. So this is how we solve a quadratic inequality. We wanna see what parts of this interval are negative or positive. So if I, just sketch on this parabola. You might say, well, how do you know that you can do that? What I usually look at is the A value. So here, our A value is equal to one, which means it's greater than zero, it's positive. So that means my parabola just opens up. So then I don't have to guess or check where things are negative. All I gotta do is look at the graph. So these two arms, they're positive, they're above the x-axis. Remember, this is the x-axis, right? Here, this number line is really the x-axis. And then below the x-axis is in between my two intervals, just like that. So really, my domain is all of these numbers, including negative 2, and then all of these numbers, including 2. So remember, we can include those values when the root is in the numerator. We can have the equal to part. So our domain might look something like this. So if you want to do it in set notation, you could say x is less than or equal to negative 2, or x is greater than or equal to 2. That's the way I would prefer to write it in set notation. 
For interval notation, you could do um, negative infinity to negative two. So we can use square brackets this time with the negative two because um, it's included. Square brackets means the points included. And then we can union that. So that just means joins, a fancy word in math for join, two to infinity, and then round bracket. So that's the first part. So obviously, that's a lot of work just for one part, one part of a question. Now, the next part is we want to look at and see if anything came out of that um, when we when we got that second step. So nothing really develops from that x squared uh, minus 4. It's just x belongs to all real numbers. It can be anything, so it's not restrictive at all. So we don't really need to consider it. The next part we want to consider is the composite function. So the composite function that we have is... 1 over x squared minus 16. So what we know about rational functions is that denominators cannot be 0. So this x squared minus 16 cannot equal 0. So we need to figure out what values will make that 0. So you could do difference of squares like over here, which is what I'm going to do. Anytime you get a chance to do difference of squares, take it just like that. So that really means that x cannot be 4 or x cannot be negative 4. And if they're either one of these numbers, this composite function is not going to exist. So if I put 4 in here, I'll have 4 squared minus 16, which is 1 over 0, which doesn't exist. So this is an example where neither one of these is the most restrictive. They have to be combined in order to make an overall domain. So we can still have the values from negative infinity to negative 2 and 2 to infinity. We just have to exclude these two numbers on those particular ones. So it's really easy to do with, with set notation. So let me do it first of all with set notation. So the domain overall, so x such that, and then we can still use the x is less than or equal to negative 2, x is greater than or equal to 2, and then you can say x cannot be plus or minus 4. So I'll just include that in one particular thing. And then all we need to say is x belongs to all real numbers. So really easy to do that in set notation. The part that I though I really want you to pay attention to is the interval notation. And uh, my students sometimes get a little miffed at me at my love of interval notation, but I really think it's more intuitive when you get more complex examples. Okay. And a lot of times in calc, your teacher is going to favor um, Interval notation. So if you got multiple choice on your test, you'll need to know interval notation. So again, we want to describe exactly what's happening. So we start at negative infinity on the x-axis and we travel all the way to negative four until something happens. So at negative four, there's a discontinuity. You can't have this negative four. So we got to include that and we use the round brackets to exclude it. And then we join it up, and then my graph continues on on the other side of negative 4. So you can imagine if this graph was going, there'd be something happening at negative 4, whether it's a vertical asymptote or whatever. There's something happening where the graph cannot be it, so we have to exclude it. So this excludes that negative 4. It can go right up to negative 4.0001, and then on the other side, negative 3.9999, okay? And then we keep traveling on the on the x-axis till we get to negative 2. Then there's a big chunk here, and negative 2 should have a square bracket. Then there's a big chunk between negative 2 to 2 that we can't have because that's where the radical will be negative. So we start there again. So the graph starts at 2, but then it reaches 4, where we have another something happening, so another VA happening there. And there's a piece of the graph that's missing. So we need to exclude that 4, and we do it with a round bracket and a union, and then another round bracket, and then we put a 4 on this side, and then smooth sailing all the way to positive infinity. And there it is. So obviously, guys, do whatever. If it's a long answer and your teacher tells you to do whatever you want, you should feel free to do that. So do, pick whatever method you like the most. For me, it's interval notation. If it's set notation for you, I would suggest being a master or a ninja of both. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. If you got any questions, feel free to hit me up. And I wish all my students best of luck on their calc test this week. 
And I will see you guys in class. Peace. A lot of boring math later. It's over. Go home. Go.